Before we prepare for meditation, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, our very own Reverend James Rodney Watson. Reverend James is celebrating 17 years of ordained ministry. He has been a member of Unity of Washington, D.C. since 2003. He is an active member with the Unity Choir, and this list is long, y'all, so bear with me. Unity Choir, ministerial support, lay leadership, worship leader, co-chair of the Ushers and Greeters Ministry, and was recently elected Vice President of the Board of Trustees. <laughs> Prior to ordination, Reverend James served from 1984 to 1995 on active duty with the United States Air Force as a contract specialist administrator at locations around the world. After the Air Force, Reverend James worked at Fannie Mae in Washington, D.C. for 10 years, where he used the experience that he gained in the Air Force um, as a contract specialist and administrator for Fannie Mae. There he served as the committee chair for the Help the Homeless campaign for five years. In 2009, he became a federal employee with the Department of Defense. He currently serves as a contracting officer with the Defense Intelligence Agency at the Joint Base Anacostia, Anacostia Bowling. Some of his activity includes member of Toastmasters and served as a representative for the National Military Family Association. He is a member of the DC branch of the NAACP where he has recently been appointed as the chapter chaplain. He is an active and supporting member of the 100 Black Men of Greater Washington, D.C. Now, if that isn't enough, Reverend James is currently pursuing a Master of Theological Studies at Wesley Theological Seminary. Please join me in giving a warm unity welcome to Reverend James Watson. There is something about that moment of meditation. If you don't find the time to do it, I guarantee you, you won't have the time to do it. So always build meditation into your daily walk, morning, noon, or night, wherever you can, because it really brings you center. It really brings you to that moment where you can say, it's okay. No matter what's going on out there, it's okay in here. Thank you, Brother Brown, for that meditation. Good morning, Unity. Good morning. Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning, friends. Good morning. And strangers I have yet to meet. Good morning. Oh, you're a stranger. <laughs> See, we have fun here at Unity. We're not at all pomp and circumstance. We're about the reality of living life to the fullest. So once again, I'm asking you to close your eyes. Take a moment and see yourself. See you as you are right now. Observe your physical characteristics. Take notice of your emotions, your feelings, your energy, your presence, the dominant trend that is you. Hold that image, know that image, acknowledge that image. Got it? Okay. I once heard a minister say, God had only one opportunity to create you, just one. And of all the seven plus billion, that's billion with a B, people on this planet, 
God did not replicate or otherwise create another being like you. Yes, we are all part of humanity, man, woman, child. However, we were all wonderfully, miraculously, and individually created by God. I thought about that for a while, and at first I was a little curious as to how does one say that statement about God. God only had one single opportunity to create you, to create me just one? Aren't we talking about the infinite, powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing God who created the universe, who created life in and of itself? He only had one, God only had one opportunity to create us? Is that placing limits on God? The truth of the matter, first and foremost, we know there is no limit to God. But secondly, this statement of one opportunity speaks to how God does what God can do. In other words, God was precise in and through that one opportunity to convey God's image and likeness thereof in creating you. It's like a neurosurgeon who has to connect the nerve endings of a single nerve in your smallest finger. That's how precise God was when God created you. This means all that you need Supplement, sustenance, strength, stability, sustainability, courage, peace, hope, compassion, knowledge, understanding, and love. All of that God placed in you through this one opportunity. And since that moment, it has been up to you, up to me, to take that opportunity to express and be what God created you to be. Recall that image that you envisioned of yourself a moment ago? Was the image clear? Or did you see some distortion? Perhaps the image was not as clear as you like it to be. This speaks to where you may be in life with relation to the opportunity God gave you in creating you. When life happens, and we know life will happen, Every day, you and I, we have an opportunity to express that which we were created to be or what, or we may find ourselves derailed or detached and guided by life. In other words, when you place your all, your happiness, your feelings, your values, your faith in others, you are expecting them to be your opportunity to express you. Remember your dominant trend in your life can be infused with all that God created you to be and the good that's in store for you. Or it can be relegated to artificial singular focus that life will put before you. The bigger picture is somehow lost. In today's environment, we would call that alternative facts. Even the very presence of divine mind, light, love, energy, can be blurred because we are so busy trying to make sense out of the things in life. How many times do we turn on the TV and wonder, why did that happen? How did that happen? Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Why this executive order? Why that executive order? Why are you trying to dismantle the past seven years? Why won't you leave things alone and do what you're supposed to? That was a distraction. That was me caught up on life and not expressing my opportunity for my highest good. Life may heap upon you layers of concern, doubt, layers of discontent, layers of fear, consciously or unconsciously, leaving you full of questions. Take, for instance, the following passage from Luke, entitled The Road to Emmaus, and I'm reading from the message. It's Luke 24, starting with verse 13. That same day, two of them were walking in the village, to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them. 
but they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, what's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? They just stood there, long faced, like they had lost their best friend. Then one of them, his name was Cleopas, said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what happened during these last few days? He said, what happened? They said, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priest and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death, and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And it is now the third day since it happened. But now, some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning, they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with a story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it empty, just as the women said, but they didn't see Jesus. Then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted. Now this is Jesus. Why can't you simp simply believe all that the prophet said? Don't you see that these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer and only then enter into his glory? Then he started at the beginning with the book of Moses and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. So here we are. It's just after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And his disciples have scattered. And these two are on the road to Emmaus outside of Jerusalem. Now we know metaphysically Jerusalem is peace. So if they're outside of peace, they're already starting in the negative. And they're so caught up in what happened. They're distraught. They're upset. They're concerned. And they're questioning over and over and over. Now here's Jesus. Jesus walks up to them face to face and they don't recognize him because they're so caught up in their emotions and what's going on around them. So, you know, he's like, hey, what's going on? What's happening? And they begin to tell him what happened like a news report. And I'm, I'm sure if you were to put yourself in the mind of Jesus at that, at that very moment, he's probably thinking, they just don't get it. They don't get it, do they? So that's what he said, well, 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 well What's the problem? I mean, I don't understand. Don't you believe? Didn't you believe my ministry? Didn't you believe what I said I was going to do? Weren't you there with me as we were doing good, as we were doing miracles, and we were healing the sick and restoring the blinds? Weren't you there when I said there was a higher purpose for this? Weren't you there? And see, then, then he took them back to the beginning. Through Hebrew scripture, through the prophets who spoke of a savior, a promise from God to bring in good life and to restore life before the incursion of fear and animosity towards this ministry consumed the people where he ultimately had to sacrifice his own. He took them back to the beginning. It's sort of like the movie from the 80s, and don't look at me like you don't know what I'm about to talk about, <laughs> entitled Back to the Future. In order for McFly to understand what was going on in the current times, what did he have to do? He had to go back to the future, to where it happened, to before it happened, to understand what got him to the point that changed the trajectory of the future that he was currently in. And that's what Jesus was trying to do with these disciples. I need you to not think about what's going on today, but go to where everything was good. Go to that point where we were all in one connective energy and that there was that positive outlook. There was that light at the end of the tunnel. There was that hope. There was that faith. What you've done is you've allowed this comma to come in and change your trajectory. Instead of going up here, you're now flying down here. Let's get that plane back up to the altitude of high flying, back to the atmosphere of openness and freedom. And that is what we need to do. We must find ourselves back to the point where God's opportunity to create you, to create me, was unencumbered by life's incursion. See, we, all, we're, we were all born. We went through adolescence. We went through teenage years, our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, and wherever we landed today. And along the way, something happened. 
Something changed our outlook. As a child, we probably wished we could be a firefighter or a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher, and we found ourselves working at a grocery store. Or we want to live in the suburbs, we want to live in the country, and we find ourselves looking, living on Fifth Street Northwest downtown. Something changed the trajectory, and then all of a sudden that something becomes the foundation for your future forward. But what Jesus was telling the disciples and what I'm saying today is go back to the real foundation. Go back to where it all started. Go back to where it was all good. See, we must be willing to step back, step away, and pronounce, stop this ride. I want to get off. This is not me. This is not who I was created to be. I am not the limited presence wandering here and there in life's, at life's whim. I am a child of the Most High God. I can bring about the good for me and those around me. See, when you have acknowledged that and you have tapped into the source, the point where God's opportunity in creating you to be all that you can be, when you've tapped into that, you are alive, you are alert, and you are awake. You are no longer mind-filled of life, beguiled by its trappings and finite moments, flirting with an existence devoid of living waters of truth. You are mindful of life around you. However, you flow in the river of abundance, creating life in its highest good. So that brings me to today's question. Reservoir canal, or swamp, which are you? Oh, suck it, suck it now. <laughs> prick, the, ooh, prick the consciousness out there? In Howard Thurman's book, Meditations of the Heart, he wrote, a, he wrote of the descriptive and functional characteristics of a reservoir, a canal, and a swamp. He describes the function of a reservoir as to hold water for it, for it to be available when needed. It provides for outflow and inflow. A canal is a channel for which water is moved from one place to another in a particular fashion. It holds water temporarily. Then once that water has been channeled from one point to another, a canal can often lie bare with no water. A swamp, just by the way you say that, a swamp, on the other hand, is unlike a reservoir or canal. It has an inlet, but no outlet. The water flows in, but does not flow out. Eventually, the water will become stale. The atmosphere of decay and death envelops a swamp. Remember earlier, you observed your dominant trend, that is you. Well, it's this dominant trend that can take on the characteristics of a reservoir, a canal, or a swamp. Particularly when we consider how we have accepted or negated the opportunity placed in us by God to be what we were created to be. When we take on the characteristic of a canal, we allow life to flow through us, sort of like a conduit, without filters. We link people to people. We link, we link energy to energy. We link place to place. We link purpose to purpose. The opportunity to be what you were created to be is determined by these outer connections. In order for me to get to where I need to be, I need to know this person. I need to network here. I need to find myself living in this particular neighborhood. I need to have this type of car. That's a canal mentality. You're allowing life to flow through you to take you to a point in hopes that that point will define what you are and who you are. You take what life gives and you run with it to the next point. Howard even mentioned that gossiping is a canal characteristic. Eventually, you may come up empty, wondering what happened. Now, as a reservoir, 
You take on the characteristics of being a resource for which you and others may draw upon in the time of need. You dwell within the opportunity God created you to be, creating and sustaining your highest good in and through you and for others. You know you are a trustee of all the gifts God shared with you in that one opportunity to be the you that you were created to be. Knowing this, accepting this, and trusting this, you share these gifts as manifested goodness for others and the world. Then we have the swamp. If you reap the characteristics of a swamp, you take and you take and you take and you take all that life gives you. You may even ransom for the nectar of earthen spoils when the opportunity to be what you were created to be is right before you. Belongings, things, traits, people, friendships, relationships, or, all, or other finite attributes become your treasure trove. Again, Howard referred to this as the art of hoarding. And the opportunity to be what you were created to be is diminished, hidden beneath the vacuum of life's promise of what it says you can be. Eventually, you may become stagnant, void of life, and all that you have collected becomes old, worthless, lifeless, leaves you, falls apart, and dies. Reservoir, canal, swamp, opportunity. Such is life. God's one opportunity to create you, to create me, is certainly, unequivocally, matchless. However, beneficial for living up to creating and expressing the life that God so desires for us to have. The choice is up to you. Do you share the gifts of God's desire to illuminate yourself and encourage others? Do you stand challenged, seeking only to connect with others in life? Or have you found it easier to gather all that you can, thinking that's all there is to life? God's opportunity is for each and every one of us to create what God wanted us to be. And in doing that, does your characteristic in following that opportunity reflect that of a reservoir, a canal, or a swamp. Always remember, the opportunity is yours and yours alone. So I ask you one last time, reservoir, canal, swamp, the opportunity is yours to choose. Go forth and make the right choice. Amen? Amen.